I would like to recognise the traditional custodians of the land on which I am privileged to be recording this vodcast today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I would like to recognise their elders past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Growth Distillery. I'm joined by Yolanda Says, the Chief Executive Officer of the St Vincent de Paul Society in New South Wales. And we are going to talk about a balancing act between purpose and profit. Now this is something that I get asked about a lot depending on the sector or the industry that we're working with. And I think that there are few industries and certainly few companies that have to walk the tightrope act that Yolanda does between profit, purpose and commerce. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Now, I'm Sydney born and raised. So Vinnie's for me is a household name. Um, I grew up with Vinnie's. Uh, but I'm conscious that there may be some that are that are listening in that might not be as familiar as I am with the work that you guys do. So I'd love um, to get your take on, you know, what, what does Vinnie's do and, and how do you go about supporting uh, New South Wales most underprivileged? Yeah, thanks very much. Look, the St. Vincent de Paul Society is actually a worldwide um, organisation. It's been in Australia for about 170 years, so we're a very long-standing charity and been doing this work in the country for a long time. Uh, we provide care and assistance to people who are experiencing poverty and disadvantage, essentially. So people who are really on the margins of society. And our ethos is actually to work with people who are the most um, marginalised, mm. people who are really doing it tough. And often we're working with people that other organisations won't work with. So we provide a whole range of services. Um, we're a member-based organisation, mm -hmm. so we actually have 11,000 members and volunteers across New South Wales and about 1,400 employees, so a pretty big outfit. Um, and we provide homeless services, uh, domestic and family violence, refuges, disability services. Yes. And we also go into people's homes and visit with them, uh, try to understand what it is they're experiencing and provide care and assistance like food, uh, clothing, mm. vouchers for um, electricity, help them with medical bills. And right now in this cost of living crisis, we're helping more and more people with their rents, mm. keeping a you know roof over their heads, um, also helping them with other expenses they weren't expecting because people are living really pay packet to pay packet. Mm. If they are in low income jobs, it's really, really tough out there. And of course, a lot of the people we're dealing with are also um, living on, on government assistance. So they're really, really feeling you know the pointy edge of this um, cost of living crisis right now. Mm. Well, firstly, Thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you. Both, yeah. you know, within this state and nationally, I think that, you know, the world needs more brilliant, you know, leaders like yourself and, and organisations like Vinnie's. Um, so then what's going on in the world of giving right now? You've touched on a couple of things. I'd love to get your take as someone that's really, you know, at the coalface, um, you know, in a year where the, the economic screws are tightening on, on a lot of households, you know, and particularly um, what I've seen, a bifurcation of, of the, the haves and the have-nots. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on on the not-for-profit space and, and, and how are you guys navigating the year that has been? Yeah, look, it's been a really tough few years. Obviously, coming out of the back of COVID, um, we were really impacted because we have a retail network, as people would, would know, yeah. um, and a very well-known retail network, which we had to close during COVID. So we had a significant impact from that. But the need from the community was the same. So we really had to balance how do we still meet the need of people who are doing it really tough whilst we're losing a lot of the revenue mm. that we use to actually provide that care and assistance. So coming off the back of COVID, um, we're, we've gone straight into a cost of living crisis. <laughs> So what we've seen there is, of course, more and more people turning to us. And what's really concerning is that 30% of the people coming to us now have never come to us before, wow. which tells us that potentially they're coming to a charity for the very first time for help. Uh, we're seeing uh, people who are in jobs coming to us because they just cannot make ends meet. They can't keep up with their rental costs. Uh, if they have a mortgage, which would be the, the smaller number of people turning to us, they're struggling, obviously, with all the interest rate increases. And they're making really difficult choices, unfortunately, every day. We're dealing with people who are choosing between putting food on the table or keeping a roof over the head. And uh, it kind of sounds like really pithy, but that's exactly what too many Australians are doing right now yeah. and we hear stories all the time of families who uh, the parents aren't eating so the kids can eat um, they're sitting in winter all lights off no heating on wearing layers of clothing jumpers you know blankets on top so that they're not using any electricity costs um, 
And so what we're seeing from the giving perspective is the need is growing, mm. um, but the money's tighter for those people also who actually do support organisations like ours. Mm. They're having to make choices as well uh, with their funding about, mm. well, do I, do I make these donations? Am I able to make my regular donations? Mm. So whilst we're not seeing the acute effect of that yet, I think it probably is likely to come. Yeah. So that's the, you know, I guess the challenge for us is the needs increasing, uh, but finding the, the donations from community and from corporates is becoming a little bit tougher. I'd love to touch on two of what I suspect is, you know, just a, a handful in the arsenal of, of different mechanics you've got to support the work that Vinnie's does. Um, the first is your store footprint, because this is where the, I think one of the tensions um, that you have to balance on a day-in, day-out basis lives, which is, you know, running a profitable shop front to where those profits are repatriated into, you know, the charitable organisation. Um, how, you know, what are you seeing playing out in in, uh, in the circular economy and, and how those stores are stocked? You look, circular economy is a growing industry. Uh, we know from research from the US that secondhand fashion is going to outstrip fast fashion, um, you know, five times by, you know, 2025, oh, wow. 2030. So there's definitely a movement towards wanting to consume less fast fashion. Mm. And particularly with the younger demographic, they're really using the environment and social causes as um, drivers to mm. where they shop and where they buy their their um their clothing or yep. other products that they might need for their house, so we've seen definitely a change in demographic of people walking through our through our front door. Um, op shopping's become very uh, I guess trendy. It's you know it's in <laughs> fashion. Uh, young people love to wear um, vintage clothing, so we've definitely seen a change in demographic. Uh, but with the cost of living, uh, mm. we were also are probably seeing more people coming to places like Vinnie's uh, rather than having to buy new uh, because it's it's more affordable. But what we're seeing is a complete change in what people expect from our shops. People want a really good shopping experience. They're not going there because um, they they need to. They're going there because they want to, which is yeah, a really big change in, in mindset, not only for us as an organisation, uh, because that's a change in mindset for us as well, because yeah. traditionally the shops, you know, they're 100 years old um, in New South Wales, uh, turned 100 last year. Uh, traditionally, they were, they were created by our members in order to raise money to help people, you know, experiencing poverty in their local community. And that's still what they are today. So all the funds raised through the shops go straight back into social programs and uh, the work of our members in local community to help people experiencing poverty. Uh, but what we're seeing is shoppers who come in, they're looking for quality, not necessarily um, something that's cheap. Mm. So they want to get something that's good quality at a good price. Mm. Uh, so that's really what's driving people into our shops right now. And how do you juggle those two mindsets? You know, you've got... Those that really need to use that, you know, the the, the Vinnie shops because um, that's the solution that aligns with their, you know, their discretionary income versus those that are going there because that's where the style that they might want to to source is. And and I can imagine that those two different, con, you know, mental models, a charity op shop versus a commercial op shop. Um, probably drives some really different decision making. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, um, we through our member network and through our services. Anyone who needs something is going to get it. So if someone comes to our shops um, and is experiencing poverty, really struggling, and they need some clothing, our, our members will work with them. Mm. Um, they'll get a voucher, a gift card, a voucher to the shop, and they can, with a lot of dignity, go mm. and choose the clothes they want for themselves. Brilliant. So we will never um, turn away from that. That's yep. our core mission, is to help people experiencing poverty. But what we understand very clearly is that the shops are a huge driver of the revenue that allow us to keep the homeless services open, allow us to provide domestic and family violence refuges. Uh, and without that revenue stream, we wouldn't be able to provide care and assistance to all those people. So I'm really comfortable with the fact that these shops are a duality, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, they provide um, clothing to people who um, are doing it tough, and mm. we'll do that with a lot of dignity through our membership and through conversation and then providing them with what they need. Uh, and then there are shoppers who come in because they, they want that experience. They're looking for that treasure, that hidden treasure, and they know they're going to find that at Vinnie's, and they're willing to pay a bit more for that um, and we are really focused on providing a great shopping experience for our shoppers because we know they're doing a few things. They're doing a good thing for the environment because they're buying second hand and reuse. Uh, they're doing a good thing for the community because the funds are going straight back in to help people and they're getting a treasure and a bargain for themselves so it's kind of like this uh, yeah, it's an triple, experience triple that result. really delights. I love that. Um, and so how have you been, you know, I'd love to get a, a, your perspective on how you've been um, innovating in your stores, right? Yeah. You, know, you and I were talking about, you 
you know, your your initial foray into e-commerce. You know, mm. I think that's a fascinating dynamic mm. um, that's about to play out. But um, what's going on? Yeah, look, there's a few things. You might have noticed, um, you know, a rebranding of our shops as well. So we've got a very um, contemporary look in our shops now, particularly the new ones that are opening up, making that shopping experience uh, more appealing for people. Uh, the research we did with our uh, customers clearly showed that they wanted that experience of a not a not a cluttered op shop, mm. something that felt engaging when they're in there. So we're trying to uh, improve the in-shop experience with the look and feel of the shops. We've really upped the brand as well. We tell the story of the shopping experience. So uh, when you go to purchase, you'll see a great sign that says, thanks, you did good. Mm. Really simple, but it just says to them, you also bought that treasure for yourself, but you actually did something good today. So we're trying to build those brand and messaging throughout the shop so that people understand the difference they're making when they're shopping at Vinnie's. They're not just getting that treasure, but they're actually making a real difference in community and and to the environment. And we know that young shoppers are really driven by both those elements. You know, what is an organisation doing for the environment? How are they environmentally mm. responsible? And what is an organisation doing in regards to social issues and causes? And we're, we're doing those um, really. Uh, it's our purpose. Yeah. So we're not doing those as a side thing, as a plan that we want to, you know, um, move into some environmental sustainability or we want to provide some social impact, that is actually our purpose. Mm. And so it's very easy for us to demonstrate that. And we're trying to do that through the in-shop experience. Other things we're doing is, you know, we've really rolled out some really um, innovative and interesting uh, marketing campaigns around our shops. We had the 100 Years of Treasures last year where we partnered with, um, you know, really high-end brands who donated goods that were hidden in our stores and people had to hunt out those treasures. That's awesome. Um, and this year we did, um, um, you know, founded at Vinnie's, uh, which is um, a really great campaign, um, you know, very contemporary looking. Uh, it's about really about that vintage shopper and that ran um, – uh, earlier this year, we'll be r running it again, um, you know, probably later in the year as an iteration of itself. So we're really looking at marketing campaigns that are brand campaigns and getting some cut through uh, about the experience of shopping, yeah. not necessarily about the purpose bit. So we're trying to find that balance. I think that, I mean, look, you're on giant shoulders, right? I think that you guys, as you said, you've spent 100 and what, 75 years really embedding purpose i think that you you yeah. know you've, you've now got the luxury of being able to have a bit of fun with your brand campaigns yeah. and talk to the storytelling yeah exactly exactly um so how then like i'm, I'm fascinated how do you go about balancing profit and purpose you mm -hmm. know because you touched on this and i think uh, a lot of the companies um that i speak with you know are trying to to navigate that balancing act but at the core they are profit driven businesses and, and as you mentioned you don't have the luxury of of an or, or, of an or you know both have to be delivered in spades because the profit from your stores funds the work that are at the core of your business um, so I'd love to get you know your take on how you've navigated that tension sure look it's it's an ongoing tension we always have it we always hold it so how do you walk the line between um, you know your purpose mm. and our mission as an organisation, which is to to build a you know more sort of just and compassionate society. Really, that's what our mission is, um, and also realising that to provide those services and to build a more just and compassionate society, we need revenue uh, streams to be able to do that. I remember um, reading an article uh, about. Um, I think it was a, it was an order of nuns who were who were running some schools, and I think one of the nuns said, "There is no mission without margin," and that really stuck with me because uh, you, we can't do the work we do unless we make decisions that are commercially based in many ways. Mm. But we always really important to us is the people we assist. Uh, at the centre of all the decisions we make mm. and our mission. And is, is this aligned with what we're here to do? Um, and if it's not, we won't be doing it. And that's pretty clear to us. But we have other commercial businesses. So we... Um we have our retail shops, so 224 of those across New South Wales, mm -hmm. 600 across Australia, so a really big retailer. But we also have um, eight... Um, automated sites for return and earn for the con container deposit scheme that we run in New South Wales. And they're run by Vinnie's. They're run really? by Vinnie's. And so all the revenue from um, from those businesses uh, go back into our service provision. Uh, we have an, a couple of other smaller commercial businesses that we run, and that's to diversify our revenue stream. Uh, obviously, we receive government funding mm. as well for a lot of the services we, we run, but we are building a very solid base of revenue that allows us to make decisions about what programs we want to run in community that align with our mission that will have the best impact on people. So it gives us that, that license to do that. Uh, we 
we just need to understand who we are and mm. really what's our core purpose here. And our core purpose is to provide care and assistance to people who are doing it tough and then make decisions that don't, I guess, divert away from that mission uh, that feel comfortable to us. And as a leader, well, I, does it feel comfortable in my gut? Does mm. it feel aligned to what we are here to do? And if it does, you know, I'm very comfortable making commercial decisions because I understand when I get up every day and go to work mm. that every decision I make and all the work we do has an end purpose of helping people experiencing poverty and disadvantage. And that's a real privilege. Mm. It's magic. And I, I love, I love what that nun said. Yeah, there so is, do I. There is, there is no mission without margin. Yeah. I think that is, uh, that is the quip of the day. Um, <laughs> And, and has that, that need to diversify, was that something that accelerated off the back of COVID where, where the vulnerability of the, of the shop front became really stark or was that something that was seeded well before then? Look, it was already underway. And yep. as I said, look, our members are incredibly innovative. I mean, I just think back, you know, our first shop opened in Newtown um, 100 years ago. And here are members working locally in community to help people and they think, oh, what, what can we do? And they see people throwing stuff out, basically, is how mm. it started. And I thought, oh that could, you know, have a second life and maybe we could sell that and we could make money hmm. to help more people. And, you know, at the time that would have been hugely innovative because it was about reuse, it was about circularity hmm. um, and it was about creating a new revenue stream. So we've always been a really innovative organisation that's adapted to the times and we continue to do that. So, look, uh, it wasn't necessarily driven by COVID, but we felt it really acutely during COVID. You know, hmm. how do we sustain ourselves if we, if we were to lose one of our revenue streams? So yeah. it has given us uh, more a push to to grow our fundraising, to grow our retail footprint, to grow our other commercial businesses for sure. And you and I spoke about this a while ago, the the impact of shifts in government structures and government regulation, because I think that this is an area that I think has a huge impact on the not-for-profit space, but to the untrained eye or to, you know, to the amateur you might discount just how meaningful those shifts can be and how, how quickly that can impact your business model. Um, I'd love for you to sort of to help our, you know, our listeners and our watchers understand um, the impact of government and, and structures around legislation and how quickly that can shift your thinking. Sure. Look, really, obviously, look, if you look at our homeless services as, as an example, mm. um, we, um, you know, received government funding to run those services. Um, obviously, as yes, governments change and they might change funding envelopes, they mm. might change criteria, um, that can have an effect. But we just engage with government. We're in very good dialogue and governments understand the role of NFPs like Vinnie's and how important and crucial they are to delivering services across the sector mm. and they're very supportive and they understand there's a need for more funding. They understand that um, it needs to be responsive. So it's always a, a conversation of dialogue. Mm. Um, but yeah, for sure. Look, you know, if a government was to change a policy on a particular funding envelope or the criteria of that, it can have a real impact on an organisation. We have to be nimble and respond mm. to that. What's really changed and what I think people don't quite understand is the level of compliance, uh, you know, acquittals, accreditation that organisations like Vinny have to go through to keep those services open and rightfully so because mm. you want to make sure you're running good services of a good quality. Uh, but there's a lot of governance uh, work that we have to undertake, a lot of compliance and reporting, uh, tracking how we provide care, our outcomes and impacts back to government mm. in order to receive that funding, uh, which is fair. Uh, we should be able to do that. But it does mean, again, that um, I don't think people understand organisations having like Vinnie's, having to have all that work to do, mm. having to have proper governance structures, you know, risks frameworks, safety frameworks. Yeah. Uh, people often think, you know, oh, charities just, they're like these small, non-complex organisations yeah. that just do good stuff in community. But in fact, we're very complex, as complex as many large uh, corporate if organisations, not more if not more, because yeah. we have all that regulation to adhere to, all the reporting to do. And, you know, of course, with our funders um, and our, you know, mum and dad donors, we need to show and demonstrate impact for the generous support that they give us. Another dynamic I'm, I'm fascinated to get your your perspective on. Um, I've certainly noticed from a, from a consumer standpoint, the proliferation of causes, you know, things like GoFundMe pages and, you know, the, just the sheer volume of <clears throat> um, different causes and opportunities for me to donate as a consumer. Is that something that, that, that you're observing as well? And, and mm. how does that impact, you know, knowing that being one of the larger players in the game, as, as you've just mentioned, the huge level of compliance and accreditation that other 
you know, small GoFundMe pages may not be subject to? And ha- how does that impact the competitive dynamics, for lack of a better word, in, sure. in the, the not-for-profit space? Look, it's interesting because often when I talk to people and, and um, you know, people use the word competitor and then they say, oh, you know, I don't mean competitor. But actually, in some ways, yeah. <laughs> they are. Look, from a service provision perspective... Of course, we need to collaborate more than ever. Mm. There's interagencies. We work with other organisations to make sure providing good care for people. And there's a lot of good work happening between organisations like Vinnie's. And we work every day together to provide care to people. Mm. When you're looking at, say, our commercial shop fronts or our donor prog- fundraising program, there is a level of um, you know others being competition, and that's mm. normal because you're really you're, you're you're appealing to the public and to corporates for the same funding. Yeah, money. it's a finite share of work. Um, so look, I think look, there is an, a large number of charities in Australia, and there has been a proliferation, as you, as you have said, of uh, GoFundMe pages and, and independent causes, mm. and really it's up to the discernment of each individual. That's how I see it. You mm. know, I donate to charities. Um, including Vinnie's, of course, but others mm. as well that yeah. are, are causes that I'm um, attached to. And it's my own discernment. I have to look at that organisation, um, see the impact they're having. Do I believe in their cause? Do I think they're using the funds that I'm giving them wisely? Is there good stewardship of those funds? Am I hearing back from the organisation about how my money was used and the difference yeah, it cool. made? Um, and then it's a, the individual choice of each donor or each corporate or each philanthropist to decide what's the cause they believe in and how do they want to partner with an organisation like Vinnie's to make an effect, you know, a difference in the community. Mm. You, you, you touched on something that I'd love, I, I want to talk to you about around engaging corporates um, and what I think to be a masterstroke, both in storytelling, but in, in you know, corporate engagement, and that is the CEO sleep out. Um, how, talk me through the, the logic behind that, because from the outside looking in, I just think that it's, what a brilliant way to empathetically tell a story and connect some of Australia's most privileged with the plight of those that are most vulnerable. Yeah, sure. Look, the, the Vinnie CEO Sleepout um, is one of our flagship events, of course, and it's been around for a long time. It was uh, it was on last week, um, and it was the 18th Vinnie CEO Sleepout. So it's a an event that has a, a, a you know longevity. It came to us actually through the founder, um, a, a guy called uh, Bernie Fion, who was doing sleepouts at his um, daughter's school, and at the same time he was attending Black tie dinners to raise funds for homelessness and he thought isn't that odd like having this beautiful dinner raising funds for a really important cause but it just feels not right and then he he came to Vinny's and said look I want to do this sleep out of business leaders I want us to sleep out and raise funds for homelessness you know mm. um and, you know, in his first event, I think it raised like $16,000. And then he partnered with Vinny's and said, look, you, you know, he was raising funds for Vinny. Mm. So I said to Vinny's, you take the event, you grow it. Um, and and um, now, 18 years later, you know, it's raised $80 million in that time wow. um, nationally to go towards homeless services. What is kind of unique about it is when, when the participants arrive, um, they go straight into what we call an experiential. So we take them through an experience that tries to ground them in the event and take them away from their day-to-day uh, focus. This year we did a, an event called Walk the Mile, which mm. gave them a persona and they had to navigate all the various um, ports of call that a person experiencing homelessness might navigate, you know, uh, Service New South Wales, the housing department, um, other services, and just to show them the frustration of what that feels like. So they'd get somewhere, say you don't have any idea, you've got to go back there and they'd have to queue up there and back there and back and forth. So it just gave them a sense of the frustration uh, that people experiencing homelessness, homelessness face when they're navigating the system. And then they sit in circles with someone with a lived experience and they listen intimately to that story about how that happened to that person Um how they fell into that situation and they, they get to ask questions and have a, a conversation. Then we take them through to um, find their place to sleep. They put the cardboard down and, and, and um, listen to a few more speeches throughout the night where we educate them about the the issue. And it's just one night and we get that. This is not something that will make them understand what it feels like to be homeless and anyone who says that is kidding themselves. It's one night of discomfort. Mm. But what we hope is that 
with, with that walk the mile or the ex- experiential experience, listening to the stories of people with lived experience whilst they're outside and they're a little bit uncomfortable, feeling a bit cold. They're actually reflecting on people that have to do that every night of the year. Mm. And when they leave there, that they have a changed perception of homelessness. They understand that it's much bigger than they thought it was. And that when they're in meetings or when they're talking to their staff or in meetings with people who hold influence, they actually advocate for changes to the structural issues that are keeping Mm. people homeless. And they partner with us in other ways to support services and run other programs. So it really is, like many other events, a kind of symbolism. Yeah, um, I was going to say that. And an empathy, a display of empathy. It's not that they they know what it feels like to be homeless. That's ridiculous. It's not what we say it is and it's not what they know it is. It's an opportunity to listen, uh, learn, be a little bit uncomfortable because it is cold when you're out there. I've Mm. done it many times. Mm feels cold, feels uncomfortable, but I know that I get to go home and have a shower and get into bed as they do. Mm. But if maybe they walk away from there and they don't cross the street and avoid a homeless person and actually engage with someone, maybe they donate to a charity or help support um, another homeless program um, that Vinnie's runs, they talk to their staff. Um, If they're they're in industries that can influence uh, the outcomes around homelessness, they actually do something about it, then we're, we're really grateful for their support and really happy to um, have maybe changed their perception, which is really what we want to do. Hmm. I think, you know, the value that, that the sleep out has probably delivered beyond, as you said, the 80 million, just in advocacy alone and, yeah. and, and compassion for those that need, yeah. that need your services, I think is profound. Yeah. Um, so where do you, where do you find it? Where do you draw your inspiration from? You know, I, I, I'd love to get your lander's perspective on, you know, just gold standard engagement from the not-for-profit sector, you mm. know, a la the, you know, the, the Vinnie's CEO sleep out. Yeah. Where, where do you draw your inspiration from? Look, there are some really great organisations telling their story really well out there. Uh, you know, some that come to mind, the Fred Hollows Foundation, really simple proposition, you know, $5 cures bl- blindness mm. and they go out and they do that work. You know, obviously they've got the iconic Fred Hollows um to tell that story and really encapsulate a man that just gave so much to make a difference and, mm. gave, and gave up so much himself of what he could have done with his own career and gave a lot of himself. So it's really, I think, a great piece of storytelling there, a great cause and something that people can connect with. Um, Oz Harvest, you know, they do a great yeah, job of great telling work. the story um, of food rescue and how that translates um, to making a difference in community for people experiencing homelessness and poverty. Um, and, you know, that's a really, really good, strong, storytelling um water aid which is not a local one but they tell a fantastic story about the difference water makes to communities across the world uh, so there are some really great organizations with great uh, message clarity great cut through um often you know great stories to tell uh, narratives to tell about the people that started those organizations so i think that they're some of the organizations that uh, i notice out there telling a really good story um and, uh, yeah, for me, you know, I think Vinnie's um, has a really simple proposition of helping people um, ex- experiencing poverty. I mean, it's pretty simple and wanting to make a difference in their lives. And what um, I guess has been our challenge is that we do a lot. Mm. We do many, many different types of service care. And so how do we tell that story with a real cut through? Um, and what sort of inspires me is just hearing store, stories of human, you know, resilience uh, every day. Mm. Um, and, you know, I might have a bad day, but it's certainly not a bad day when I compare it to the stories of the people that the, the St. Vincent Paul Society is helping every day. Yeah. And there's a, there's a level of um, humility you take when you, um, you know, what I say to my kids when they complain about things, first of all, problems, and they really are first of yeah. all problems when you look around. Uh, and I think people are sh- would be shocked to learn about the stories unfolding every day in Australia because I think most people see us as a wealthy country, which we are. Most Australians, I don't think, understand the level of poverty that some people are experiencing in our own country. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that there's a, there's a stark reality that we probably are, are all a little bit opaque to. Yeah. Um, you mentioned resilience. I'd like, I'd love to, to change gear just a little bit because I think one of my, my passions is, is, you know, is leading teams to growth. Um, and I'm conscious that there's probably a really unique dynamic. Um, and again, you know, another one of the tensions that you have to juggle, um, in building resilience within your teams, right? Because I think that there's, there's supporting the narrative and storytelling outside of the building, but, uh, you know, 
in a year where I've observed the screws tightening on, on you know, the teams that I, that I have the privilege of working with, how do you go about building resilience in your teams? Because I can only imagine in, you know, what they have to see and what they have to support day to day can be really taxing. And, and, and I'd love to get your, your, you know, some advice or, or a toolkit around how you build resilience amongst, you know, the teams that work at Vinnie's in New South Wales. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a lot of our people are at the real coalface dealing with uh, terrible stories um, of the people they're assisting. And they do hear some very um, challenging things. They have to walk with people on that journey, our members as well, going into people's mm. homes and listening to the stories of hardship. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we are a, our model of care is very re- re- relational. We mm-hmm. do that face-to-face. We're not transactional and we try to stay away from being transactional. So even more so, uh, people are really walking with uh, the people that we assist. So what we do, um, we, we support our staff. You know, they have um, uh, time to debrief um, with their teams. Mm. Uh, they have access to counselling themselves for anything they need to offload. Obviously, if, if something happens that is very acute in a service, we'll provide um, assistance through, a, you know, a formalised program. But we also provide pastoral care. Mm. So we have staff on board who will go into services and talk to our people about um, an incident that may have occurred or... Uh, something they've had to deal with, but they regularly debrief. They have an opportunity to do that, and that's really important. Um, our, we, have, we have peer-to-peer support from other people in the organisation to, to help them with um, uh, the issues they're dealing with every day, and um, they're seeing things at the very, very pointy end. So we have a lot of programs of peer, peer-to-peer support, uh, debriefing for our staff, providing them with other formal programs of care and assistance should they need that, as well as the pastoral care that we have built into our organisation to provide people with an opportunity to just have a chat yeah. and, and unwind from that day. So, And there's a lot of self-care that people at the front line will be undertaking every yeah. day um, and the ability to, you know, to compartmentalise as much as you can what you hear at work and then, you know, going back to your own home. So uh, they are very skilled at doing that as well. That's something they learn with time as well. But certainly it's really important to give them the space and time to unpack what they've been dealing with and have another peer to talk to to support them through that. And, and the teams do do that on a regular basis. Um, I think part of the last you know few years has been very challenging for everyone and I think that all organisations are dealing with the kind of post-COVID uh, engagement of people, mm. how do we engage people. And for us, it's really about trying to be as clear as we can around uh, the purpose of the organisation and most of the people uh, working for us are aligned to that you know, vision and purpose and are with us because they believe in what the organisation is doing or they want to work for a not-for-profit because they, they want to contribute or give back to community and they see that their role, whatever that role is, whether it's at the front line or whether it's in the finance team Mm. um, or whether it's uh, in the marketing team, that all of them play a really significant role in making sure someone gets a meal that day, making sure someone gets a bed that day. And we need to, we tell that story to our people, but we need to do more of that. And I'm really determined to Mm. connect all of our people back to our mission and the difference they're making, regardless of where they are. And it always reminds me of the story, which I don't even know if it's a true story, but I heard it once and it stuck with me um, about a president going through, through NASA and he asked the janitor, you know, what do you do here? And he said, I help put people on the moon. Um, and I don't know if it's true, but I loved it. And I heard that somewhere and it always stuck with me because I think it's really important for the person in our homeless service um, providing direct care will clearly see that for themselves every day. But how do I make the person, you know, doing accounts receivable understand that when they pay that bill for that food or for that service, they're actually helping put someone into a bed that night as much as the person at that front line. I think that is sage wisdom. And I think that that is applicable in any any business. You know, how do you make every one of your employees top to bottom connected to your purpose and your mm. mission? Um, do you find that there is added complexity? You know, I, I presume, I'm going to presume that, you know, that you work with people that may be less motivated by money than, you know, say banking or, you know, or the tech space. Um, but as the economic screws tighten this year. I think, you know, we're all, all of us in our households relative to our lifestyle making these trade-offs. Um, how do you go about leading teams that, that may be less incentivized by money and, and, you know, and to your point, you know, driving engagement beyond just that connectivity to purpose? Yeah, sure. Look, for us, I guess a lot of people that come to work for organisations like Vinnie's um, are not motivated 
primarily by money. Mm. We want to pay our people fairly and mm. make sure they're of being uh, remunerated fairly for the work that they do. But yeah, we're not competing with you know large financial institutions when it comes to re- remuneration mm. for similar type jobs. Uh, but people do come to us because they believe in the cause of the organisation. And so that's why what I was talking about earlier really is so important. Mm. How do we connect them to the mission? Because that's probably the reason that they're working at an organisation yeah, like Vinny's. Uh, so how do we say, yes, you need to be developed properly, you need professional development, you need mentoring, you need all the things other people need in all organisations, you need to be uh, fairly remunerated for the work that you do and you need to be recognised and acknowledged for that work. That's really important. Like any other employee, they, they want to be fairly paid, they want to be recognised for the good work they're doing, they want an opportunity to be professionally developed um, as any other employee would uh, mm. because they're there to do a job and that's their, that's their work and they have pride in that work like I do in my work. Uh, but uh, they could choose to work in other organisations that pay them a lot more money if they wanted to. So mm. they are coming to organisations like Vinny's because they believe in what we do. So connecting them to mission and making them see that mission come alive every day, sharing the stories of uh, the work we're doing uh, is really, really vital. So how do we tell them about the difference we're making every day in community mm. How do we do that better as an organisation internally so that our our staff and our volunteers and members are really engaged with what we're doing and understand they're making a difference every day? And that's a benefit of their employment as well. Mm. Uh, but we need to get all the other things right as well. You know, if we're not yeah. paying people properly, if we're yep. not recognising them properly, but not develop, developing them properly, um, you know, we won't keep them. So retention is really, really important um, because we need to find really skilled people who do the jobs really well, recognise them for that. But tell them that, you know, when you're here, you're also making that huge difference. And they're already making that choice when they walk through the door mm. because they understand that. Uh, so we just need to keep them focused on that. I love it. Yelena, we, we have covered in this conversation everything from organisational growth to professional growth, purpose-led growth to, you know, um, you know personal, personal growth in terms of ha- how I want to contribute to society. Um, I think that the complexity and the, the nuance in terms of the tensions you have to balance is, is truly inspiring. Um, and for those that, that would love to take a leaf out of your book, um, either in the not-for-profit space or otherwise, um, what would be your three rules for, for brands or leaders looking to support growth in, in this space or otherwise over the coming year? Yeah, look, I think for organisations in NFP, we're looking to connect with growth in giving, for example. I think that it's really important to be authentic mm. as a brand. So, you know, we have to align with our purpose. I think people very quickly can see through uh, an organisation that isn't authentic about its mission and its purpose. Mm. So we need to be really clear, what is our purpose? Right? Why are we here? Mm. And once we get that really clear, we need to weave that through all the decisions we make. And if you're making decisions that are in contrast to the purpose or your mission or your values, that doesn't doesn't pass the sniff test, when, particularly when you're an NFP or a charity, right? You can't say we're this type of organisation, but we're making these decisions that are actually contrary uh, to our values. So that's really important, I think, you know, be really, really, and be relevant, mm. right? How are you relevant? I mean, Vinny's is really relevant right now. Mm. You know, we deal with people experiencing poverty and disadvantage, people facing those cost of living pressures, uh, people experiencing homelessness. Ma- maintain your relevancy to people. What's mm. important to the community and maintain relevancy and respond to issues that people care about. I think that's really important. Um, building authentic partnerships. You know, I think if you're an NFP, you have to go beyond going to a corporate or a philanthropist and saying, you know, we need money to run this program. Really important that we do need that money. Mm. But build an authentic partnership. What can the partner also get from that relationship? Mm. How do you actually connect them to the cause of your organisation and the long-term vision? Because I think the long-term impact is more and more important to people each and every day. So Mm. how do we make sure that we're building authentic partnerships that are long-term and that are actually going to affect long-term change, not just like, you know, a change for one day or for a week or for a month. So that's really important as well. And I think measuring impact. You know, we need to tell the story as an organisation of the difference we're making in community and how do we share that story of impact. Philanthropists want to know, government wants mm. to know, individual donors want to know, corporates want to know. So how do we measure, evaluate, assess the work we do to understand its impact? Because not only will that be an uh, important story to be able to tell people out there so that people know, do I want to support this organisation? Is it making enough of a difference? Yes, it is. So this is, sounds like a great organisation to partner with. But for ourselves, we need to understand 
are we having the right sort of uh, impact on the people we're trying to assist? Mm. Uh, where's their voice in how they want to be assisted? So if we're not evaluating our own programs and understanding their impact, how can we make them better? So for me, they're the kind of three things I think uh, NFP uh, would would need to align themselves to if they really want to uh, increase their impact, increase, increase giving uh, right now. I love that. I, I think... You know, in particular, I love the idea of the power of a coalition of the willing. And this was something that, you know, a few episodes ago we were speaking about with um, with Andrew Thurkelson from the lab. Um, and then a word on what this doesn't look like. You know, I always, I always like to offer this as the final question, just on the in case that someone may be misinterpreting, you know, your uh, your guidance on, on, you know, sources of growth. Yeah, look, I think what it doesn't look like is transactional relationships. Okay. Now, be that with the people we're helping mm -hmm. or with our partners and supporters. You know, I don't think it uh, does anyone any good to um, be having transactional um, relationships in regards to receiving funding from organisations. It really does need to be an authentic and genuine partnership. And they want to affect change. They've decided as part of their strategy they want to assist communities doing particular things and they want to make change. And so how do we partner authentically? So I just think always being authentic and not doing anything that sits outside your value set as an organisation um, is really important. So it certainly doesn't look like uh, doing whatever is going to get you the money. I love that. Yolanda, thank you so much for joining us on The Growth Distillery. I have truly, truly enjoyed this chat. Thanks uh, very much for having me on. You are most welcome. Welcome.